All right, dear brothers and sisters, let's start the session today, inshallah. Bismillah, wa alhamdulillah, wa salawat, wa salam ala rasulullah, wa alihi, wa sahbihi, wa min wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear excellent brothers and sisters, members of ISIP, colleagues uh, from all over the world. It's such an honor to be with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. As usual, uh, we really appreciate you taking your time to seek knowledge in the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your trajectory of being a seeker of knowledge and a talib towards uh, this sacred field. And uh, we really appreciate that you share out of your precious time in being with us in this suhbah. Because besides offering lectures, ISIP, the International Students of Islamic Psychology, we're all about being family and we always emphasize suhbah and to learn from each other, from each other's expertise, experience, and knowledge, inshallah. Feel free to introduce yourself in the Zoom chat. Feel free to change your names and add which country of origin you have. It's always exciting to see that we're such an international movement with members and participants from all over the world. During the session, we will share some resources in the Zoom chat. Uh, and from the behalf of uh, ISIP, uh, Sister Nadira, Sister Shirin, and myself, we want to welcome you to this lecture today, inshallah. We will do a brief presentation now of ISIP, our mission statement, our objectives, and then we will introduce the main speaker of today, Dr. Omar Rida from Libya and the United States of America. And the topic is a very exciting topic. A lot of you have really uh, have written to us and thanking us for organizing this. Uh, and it is a very important topic indeed. So we look forward to learn from our uh, excellent teacher and Ustad, inshallah. So bismillah. So today's lecture will be about healing trauma and the story of the beloved Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam together with Dr. Omar Rida from Libya and US, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today's agenda, dear brothers and sisters and excellent colleagues, uh, we will start by reciting Surah Al-Fatiha just to get the blessings from Allah Azza wa Jal. And then we will, we will go through some welcoming and some guidelines. And then we will share some certificate of appreciation to our excellent Ustad for his excellency in the field. After that, we will, we will listen to Dr. Omar. And uh, he, his presentation will be for about 50 to 60 minutes. And then we will have a Q&A session where you guys can ask your questions and we will direct them to Dr. Omar. So dear brothers and sisters, feel free to ask your questions in the Zoom chat. And we will address them at the Q&A. And, uh, and at, 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 at the end of the session, we will have some closing du'as and we will share some forms for get, get, getting some of your feedback, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. So let's start by just reciting Surah Al-Fatih, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan, dear excellent sisters and brothers. So a little bit about the Zoom etiquettes, as you always know, keep muted at all time, actually, uh, just for the benefit for our, for our lecture. Uh, no recording or screenshots uh, are allowed because we will uh, offer the recording in, in a couple of days. You will find it in ISAP's YouTube channel, and we will share the link to our YouTube channel. So if you haven't subscribed, feel free to subscribe and share the beneficial knowledge, inshallah. Also, we already asked Dr. Z uh, Dr. Omar if we are allowed to share his PowerPoint slides to all of you as participants, and he has agreed. He's been very generous, so we appreciate that. So all of you who registered to the session today, you will receive an email with the YouTube uh, link to the lecture and the slides as well. So if you haven't registered to the, the session, we will also share the registration link. So register to the session, and you will have access to both the recording and the PowerPoint slides as well. Jazakallah khair and dear brothers and sisters. Any questions, uh, feel free to ask them in the Zoom chat uh, throughout the session, and we will address them to Dr. Omar in the end during the Q&A. If you need any live transcriptions, dear excellent brothers and sisters, please press the more button in the Zoom and ask uh, and request for it, and we will, we will be more than happy to, uh, to give you that access, inshallah. A little bit about ISIP's mission statement. So ISIP, the International Students of Islamic Psychology, we try to be an inclusive space, dear brothers and sisters, designed to connect people with diverse backgrounds interested in the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health. We aim to disseminate knowledge, share resources, and discuss best practices in a free and accessible manner. So everything we do in ISAP, dear brothers and sisters, is free of charge because we want everybody 
no matter which social, economic, or background you have, or where in the world you live, to benefit from the sacred knowledge. Also, inclusivity for us is that no matter if you're young or old, if you're a mental health professional or not, if you're an alim or alima or not, if you're a student or a senior, as long as you're interested, you're more than welcome to join our organization, Sohba and Movement, inshallah. We also want to be a platform to enable further development of people's personal and professional interests, studies and understanding of Islamic psychology within their communities and countries of origin. That's why in ISIP, dear participants, brothers and sisters, we have local and regional chapters all over the world so that we can fill the gaps when it comes to the necessities of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health within your communities or your local context, country, and region. So for instance, our excellent colleague here, Sister Shireen, She's the task force facilitator and head of the Southern African chapter of ISIP. So if you're from South Africa or from the Southern African region, feel free to connect with her. We have uh, uh, chapters all over the world. Also, if you want to establish a chapter in your country and we don't have any chapter there, feel free to reach out to us. We will add our email address in the Zoom chat and we will be more than happy to support you in facilitating that process as well. We also have several task forces and project groups working with different aims, such as Disability Task Force, Revert Mental Health, Refugee Mental Health, Supervision, Peer-to-Peer -peer Support Groups, etc. If you're interested, feel free to join and we will add information on how you can join in the Zoom chat as well. If you can mute your microphone, there's somebody who has not muted their microphone, I would really appreciate it. Jazakallah khair. Maybe Sister Sharina, Sister Nadira, you can mute that person, please. Thank you. Jazakallah khair, sisters. Uh, ways to contribute to the movement, uh, you can subscribe to ISIP's YouTube channel. The link will be shared in the Zoom chat by my colleagues, Sister Shireen and Sister Nadira. You can also join one of our Islamic psychology WhatsApp groups for discussions and resource sharing, and we will share that link in the group as well. And you can also become a member of ISIP via our website at www.iisip.foundation. Membership is free of charge, of course, and when you become a member, then you can get access also to our digital library, to your brothers and sisters with over a thousand resources in the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health. So most welcome to join. All right, let us now present our uh, speaker for today. We're very honored to have with us Dr. Omar Reda. Dr. Omar is part of our advisory board at ISIP and we're also establishing the research center of ISIP, the al Belkhi Institute. And we also have Dr. Omar with us there, which is such an honor. He's a board certified psychiatrist Harvard trained trauma expert. He's an author. He has written several books and we will share the links to his books in the Zoom chat as well. And we will email out the links to his books as well. So feel free to buy them and support our, uh, our excellent Ustad. He's also founder of Untangled and the Wounded Healer Models of Care, which is his organization, an amazing organization doing an amazing work. He lives with his wife and three daughters in Colorado, US, but he's of Libyan origin. He has master's degree from Harvard University in refugee and global mental health after completing medical school in Libya and while undergoing extensive training with the University of Tennessee in US. He lead, he's a leading expert in psychotraumatology and trauma-informed care, as well as the mental health of Muslims, immigrants, and refugees. SubhanAllah. And we're actually establishing a refugee mental health support group and task force in ISAP. So we will love to have with us Dr. Omar and this uh, on Devor. And if you guys are interested in working with refugee mental health, feel free to join us in this, dear brothers and sisters. There is uh, there is still the microphone that is not muted. So if you could just mute that, we would really appreciate it. Jazakallah khairan. This is just uh, to you, Dr. Omar Rida, a certificate of appreciation from Sister Shirin, Sister Nadira, myself, and rest of the ISAP team and all of our members and colleagues and our task forces for appreciation of your time and efforts and in recognition of your continuing excellency in the field of Islamic psychology and Muslim mental health. And we will email this to you as well. Sister Nadira will do it after the session. Jazakallah khairan, dear Ustad, for being with us and for giving us opportunity to learn from your vast amount of knowledge. Thank you for attending once more, dear brothers and sisters and participants. An honor to be with all of you. Please forgive me for any shortcomings and us for any shortcomings and all the good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And make dua for us and please fill out the short feedback form that will be shared in the end of the session as well. And also save this date. This will be our next session, uh, the, the 11th of December at 11.30 a.m. GMT, GMT. So Sunday, the December 11th. 
with Safiya Kent Al Sabri from US. We will have a session with the topic of grief support for Muslims, which is a very important topic. And it's actually connected a little bit to what Dr. Omar is speaking about today. So you're more than welcome to join and add this to your agendas and calendars. And of course, we will share more information about this session and all of our WhatsApp groups and social medias and in our newsletter as well, inshallah. All right, let me stop sharing my screen. Without any further ado, uh, Dr. Omar, uh, feel free, brothers and sisters, to give round of digital applause to our dear Ustad, and the floor is yours. Most welcome, Dr. Omar, an honor to have you with us. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa ala rasulullah. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be with you today, mashallah. I'm very, very excited about uh, this topic, and I'm really grateful want to start with a word of gratitude to ISIP and also Brother Jamal Din and Sisters Nadira and Shireen. Mashallah, you do a beautiful work and I'm very grateful for everybody in the room today. Uh, you come from different parts of the world and Alhamdulillah, we are uh, meeting to talk about a very, very beloved topic to me, which is uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Inshallah, hopefully you can see my slides and as a brother Jamal said, inshallah, these slides are yours. I'm, I'm going to share them. Uh, so I would love for you, inshallah, to have an uh, interactive discussion. So any topic that speaks to your heart, uh, please uh, write down a note that we can, inshallah, engage in a beautiful discussion about our beloved, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, at the end. So uh, this is about many things that happened during his blessed life, alayhi salatu wasalam. Um, test trial, tribulation, but mainly he focused on healing. His life was uh, healing centered. Uh, his example was uh, that of a post-traumatic transformation. And that's an area of a uh, passion of mine. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. I come from the country of Libya. Uh, I was working as an emergency room physician, actually before becoming a psychiatrist. But uh, subhanAllah, I was forced to leave Libya and live in the United Kingdom as an asylum seeker and then I came to the United States after September 11. And as you know, in 2011, Libya went through a very uh, difficult time with the civil war. And uh, still the country is struggling. And Alhamdulillah, I found myself going to refugee camps in Libya, Syria, Bangladesh. And it has been my pleasure and honor to uh, try to be part of the solution for many refugees and uh, trauma survivors. And uh, through that, Allah helped me to create uh, two models of care. One is called Untangled, which is uh, to break the cycle of trauma, especially family and community trauma. And we can talk about Untangled towards the end, inshallah. And the other one, uh, a model of care that I just recently founded after publishing the book, The Wounded Healer. And this is to take care of the caregiver. All of us in the room are doing a beautiful job. We are the glue that uh, holds our families and communities together. And we need to take care of our needs because subhanAllah, self-care is a, a sunnah. Rasulullah and the Quran have told us, you know, very clearly that we need to take care of ourselves if we want to continue this sacred work, which is uh, taking care of others, is the work of the Anbiya. And it's the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the trauma is not necessarily um, a reason for us to judge people or label them. And like Rumi said, he said, the wound is the place where the light enters you. So um, trauma can be the source of our growth and transformation and so on. So Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We are talking about uh, Rasulullah alayhi wa salam. So inshallah, we're going to uh, renew our intention and enter with ikhlas. It's an extreme honor to be talking about Rasulullah. And as uh, all of you know, uh, know that uh, subhanallah the human spirit can thrive not only survive in uh, the case of uh, a trauma or adversity actually uh, i would argue maybe it's because of the trauma um, it's people will gain growth and beauty and discover resilience and find their coping skills and discover things that they haven't known about themselves before they were subjected to their trauma and one great example of uh, the post-traumatic transformation, I would uh, argue the best example is Rasulullah He gave us uh, many, many beautiful ways how to cope with trauma, how to manage stress. And I'm going to share some of these, inshallah, with you. 
and alhamdulillah the book uh, is uh, currently work in progress so if uh, i i don't touch on one of the traumas that uh, happened during his life if i don't touch on an incident that you are familiar with please uh, reach out because i would love inshallah for the book to be comprehensive and i would love to hear your input how to um, inshallah help the millions of uh, trauma survivors muslims and non-muslims using the example of the quran and the sunnah so when i started uh, working on this book alhamdulillah and it was really a very emotional experience um, going through every single ayah in the quran and uh, trying to go through the seerah of rasulullah very humbling experience because when we meet rasulullah we meet him with deep love and we learn from him every single day rasul alayhi salatu wasalam he did not only uh, you know master interpersonal interaction and interpersonal safety but also many survival skills life skills coping skills social skills and all of these were uh, quote unquote discovered by the field of psychology many many centuries after him alayhi salatu wasalam and uh, writing this book is not um, really an autobiography of rasul salam. there are many beautiful books that talk about him like ar rahiq al makhtoum and others but my focus inshallah is to humanize rasulullah salam. yes we see him and we love him as a prophet but today i want you to also see him and love him as a human as a wounded healer himself and yani subhanallah we can inshallah also uh, engage in beautiful discussion about uh, do we really apply a terminology like trauma and the wounded healer to somebody like Rasulullah or the prophets alayhim salatu wasalam? And we can inshallah engage in that discussion towards the end. And uh, my intention is uh, inshallah to just uh, present Rasulullah as an example of somebody who went through many traumatic experiences. His character was shaped by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. I, I wanted today to shed light on his life as a human, as a husband, as a father, as a son, as a companion, as somebody who went through many difficult trials and tribulations and how he managed to go through all of these with grace and how he continued to be actually a source of healing and enlightenment for everybody around him. So this topic is not an easy one. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, heavy emotional things that happened to Rasulullah. So please make sure that you take care of yourself. If you need to pause, if you need to go and take care of one of your immediate basic needs, this is a sa safe space, inshallah. And it's uh, actually maybe the most uh, safest of uh, places that I have ever engaged in because uh, Rasulullah is with us in this space. So to talk about uh, Rasulullah, we are talking about uh, walking with reverence, with awe, and with deep humility. And uh, inshallah, yani, uh, together we're going to understand how through all of uh, the things that he went through, we can have a curriculum, we can have a role model, we can have a road map. Because subhanallah, yani, and we are not missing the uh, example of Rasulullah. We just miss the connection with him. We have the most beautiful road map. And, you know, action items in the Quran and Sunnah. We just need to go back to that pure source. And uh, I know that I'm going to fall short talking about Rasulullah. So I'm asking for your grace and your forgiveness and your prayers. Uh, any mistake we make is uh, from ourselves and anything that we say that's good from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So together, inshallah, uh, hopefully uh, this time, this uh, 90 minutes or so, will be one more reason for you to love Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. So we are reminded throughout the Quran and the Sunnah and the Seerah not to view Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam as a, only a prophet, but also to view him as a human that we can learn from his example. Uh, Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam, he was really the master of mending broken hearts. He was very, very keen on taking care of people's emotional affairs. He was checking on the young Sahaba, he was checking on the elderly, he was checking on the women, he was checking on people who are otherwise forgotten and voiceless. He went out of his way to um, give us the permission 
to use safe and healthy ways to express our emotions. And subhanAllah, this is like uh, amazing because his own trauma, his own uh, bleeding wounds were too many, but he continued to be a source of healing. So some people will say, can you really give from what you have not received? Can you really be uh, a healer when you are still wounded healer? And throughout the life of Rasulullah he exhibited and embodied that and he continued to emerge from a lifelong of pain and suffering as a source of hope and joy and inspiration for everybody around him. Inshallah, uh, together we can find out how did he do that and try to learn from him. And by the end of the day, we can have a toolkit uh, built by Rasulullah himself. So imagine, inshallah, uh, this is a beautiful day because, subhanAllah, we are talking about the beloved and uh, how we can use his example to become wounded healers ourselves. So before we talk about uh, his uh, quote-unquote trauma story, I just want to define trauma and also see what's the impacts of trauma. And then we can talk about uh, stress management in Islam, emotional expression and the Quran and Sunnah. And then we can, inshallah, uh, go and dive into uh, the trauma story of Rasulullah So very, uh, you know, simplistically, a trauma in Greek means wound and trauma and bear the SAMSA, which is the substance abuse and mental health administration uh, organization, the United States. They said it's uh, basically a combination of three things. All of them, they start with the letter E. So the first thing is the event. So what, what happened to you? The event is what happened to you. And then the experience. What's your understanding of what happened to you? What's your perception of what happened to you? And then the effects. What are the impacts, mainly the psychosocial and the spiritual impacts of what happened to you? Also the biological, because we know that humans are made of a body, mind, heart, and soul. So trauma can affect our biological needs, our psychological needs, our social needs and our spiritual needs. And subhanAllah, yani, a trauma should not be uh, viewed as a sign of uh, weakness, should not be associated with stigma. People should not view traumatized individuals as uh, a moral failure or that people have a weak faith or weak iman. Of course, the Quran and Sunnah are beautiful uh, healing tools, but also people might need extra support. So we can tell people that to read the Quran and engage in salah and remember the story of Rasulullah At the same time, we can, inshallah, direct them to other resources in the community, resources within themselves, resources with their family, and so on, inshallah. So uh, I understand and I believe as a psychiatrist that uh, a trauma itself is not a mental disorder. It is a, almost a moral injury. It's a moral distress because we uh, care about others because Things happened to us that affected our deep core beliefs, our soul. Um, but trauma, if we don't acknowledge it, it can lead to psychic pain, can lead to restless soul. And subhanAllah, if we uh, keep neglecting or ignoring our trauma story, usually it will lead to lots of dysfunction, especially in relationships. So maybe our relationship with our spouses, our parents, our siblings, our children, our community members. Uh, people around us, mo Muslims and non-Muslims, maybe our uh, you know, behavior uh, becomes unsafe. Maybe we're going to lash out. Maybe we're going to shut down. This is because we are re-enacting our trauma story if we don't acknowledge it. And the Rasul, as we're going to, inshallah, discuss, uh, he gave us permission to share our trauma story. So if we continue out of shame or guilt or because of uh, culture, or because of stigma and taboo, if we continue to really hide our suffering, uh, that means many people will continue to suffer in silence as individuals, as families, as communities. And this is something that uh, neither Allah nor Rasulullah encourage us to do. We should not hide our suffering. Actually, the Sahaba came to the Prophet ﷺ with all of difficult issues and difficult questions, and he never uh, shun them away. He never reprimanded them. He never asked them to uh, shut down or shut up or anything like that. Alayhi salatu salam. If we don't uh, really talk about our trauma story, we can repeat it. 
can repeat a cycle of neglect or cycle of abuse. We can uh, lead to transgenerational impact of trauma. And this is very unfortunate because if we give our trauma story to our children, it will uh, uh, really cast very dark shadows on their body, their mind, their heart, their soul, their relationships, and their uh, sense of identity, their beauty, their full potential as Khalifatullah fil uh, Ard. So we are created to be the Khalifa of Allah. We represent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. So you cannot really reach your full potential or be a Khalifa of Allah and a follower of Rasulullah wasalam, to the best of your ability if you are wounded healer, if you continue to be walking wounded, if your wounds are profusely bleeding and you are neglecting them. So that's why, subhanAllah, if you have a trauma story that you have not talked about, uh, please don't pass it to your children, especially if uh, your trauma story is distorted, you have cognitive distortions, you have uh, self-doubts, you are doubting your own identity and your own core beliefs and, and that the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you you are the best creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are fadlna karamna bani adam wa fadlnahum ala kathirim man khalaqna tafdila. So subhanallah, and it's very important to understand that we are very honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are beloved by Rasulullah alayhi salatu wasalam. And that's why we need inshallah to heal our relationships. It's my uh, deep belief that uh, subhanallah, most of our trauma happens because of uh, our relationships and most of our healing inshallah will happen when we heal our relationships and uh, the pandemic is a very good example of that we have uh, seen with social isolation and social distancing and how many people really suffered from loneliness and uh, they went into extremes like despair and uh, substance use and even suicide unfortunately because they did not have the social support that's needed and subhanAllah, healing trauma in Islam is a communal affair. We do it as uh, no individuals, but mainly we do it as families and also as a community, inshallah. If we give uh, each other a safe space to talk about our trauma story, uh, trauma survivors will regain their voice. They will actually start, inshallah, towards a journey uh, to uh, closure, to forgiveness, to meaning, to healing. And the, their journey becomes authentic. If you don't talk about your trauma story, if you are a wounded healer, if you are a caregiver that uh, going through burnout, you are not really presenting authentically to the people that you are trying to serve. So that's why I am um, going to repeat many times that self-care is not a luxury. It's a responsibility. And it's actually a sunnah to take care of yourself and your small family and uh, make sure that uh, you have a little bit of uh, gas left in your tank to continue to give to others. Rasulullah and some people argue that um, because he said, Ana ibn I am the son of the two men that were about to be slaughtered. He means uh, his father, Abdullah, and he means his uh, great grandfather, Prophet Ismail, السلام, both of them, they were about to be sacrificed and subhanAllah, uh, some people in the field of psychology, they say maybe there are uh, imprints on the DNA of Rasulullah because of uh, the transgenerational trauma that his own family went through. And we know, subhanAllah, even in the year of the elephant, which is the year he was born, السلام, the whole city of Mecca was restless. So subhanAllah, maybe that even impacted uh, uh, the way that his mom dealt with his, her own anxiety when she was pregnant with Rasulullah And we don't have too many stories about uh, Abdullah and Amina, uh, the parents of Rasulullah, but inshallah, we're gonna touch on their story uh, in the next few slides. So trauma for Rasulullah was like a privilege. He received everything that was given to him, uh, good and bad, if you like. And there is nothing really uh, bad. There is khair in every shar. And uh, subhanAllah, there is a minha in every mihna. Uh, there is also, subhanAllah, uh, even from the pain and suffering, the beauty and hope can reborn. So everything that happened to him, he found a reason to turn it from the negative to the positive. He found a reason, inshallah, to continue to be a source of healing. So he received all the trials and tribulations with gratitude, and he shared 
uh, his trauma story through acts of compassion. He became a source of grace and service to everybody around him. And subhanAllah, Surah 67 in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us that uh, we are tested and to show grace. And this is a subhanAllah, this is Surah Al-Mulk, Tabarak al al mulk Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, uh, Whenever we are tested, it is uh, the reason for testing is ihsan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to reach a status of ihsan uh, through giving us uh, trials and tribulations. And if we pass the test, that means we embody the beautiful quality of Rasulullah, which is the quality of ihsan. And we know our deen is made of uh, Islam, Iman, and ihsan. And Ihsan is the highest status in our deen. So yes, I mean the five pillars of Islam, as we know, uh, Shahada, As-Salah, Al-Zakah, as sawm and Al-Hajj, they have to do with the rituals of uh, our deen. The six articles of uh, faith, Arkan Al-Iman al sitta to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Malaikatihi, Kutubihi, Rusulihi, Al-Yawm Al-Akhir, Al-Qadr, Khayruhu wa Sharru. They have to deal with the matters of creed, but subhanallah, the highest and the most beautiful status of uh, our religion, and it was the focus of Rasulullah sallallahu how he lived his life was the maqam of ihsan. Alayhi salatu wasalam, he was always, always compassionate, kind, eloquent, elegant, emotionally available, graceful, especially when it comes to dealing with people who are forgotten and voiceless, people who are traumatized, people with the special needs, and so on. Rasulullah he always, always went out of his way to reach out to them and to get them out of uh, the shadow and out of silence and make sure that their needs are taken care of, subhanAllah. Remember, please, if you forget anything about today, remember one thing, the best way to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to serve his creation. The best way to worship the creator is to serve the creation. خَيْرُ النَّاسِ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ The best among you is the one who is best to Allah's creation. And Jabr al-Khawatir, to mend broken hearts and to take care of uh, people emotional affairs is a huge sunnah, is a, one of the most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to Rasulullah alayhi wa And we remember how مَنْ سَقَى كَلْبًا دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ فَكَيْفَ بِمَنْ سَقَى قَلْبًا we know that uh, an example of somebody who gave water to a thirsty dog and Allah entered them into paradise. So how about when you give water to a thirsty heart, a thirsty soul, when you take care of somebody who is emotionally struggling, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a huge reward, inshallah. Uh, Islam, I believe, is a comprehensive way of life. And the Quran and Sunnah continue and will continue to be the only two authentic uh, sources for us, for guidance and for serving and so on. And uh, subhanAllah, yani, as I said, uh, I had a great pleasure and privilege of uh, going through the whole Quran and also trying to go through extensive research of the seerah. And uh, I just wanted to share, inshallah, a few things that happened to Rasulullah But first, let us talk about uh, stress management in Islam and emotional expression in the Quran and Sunnah. So starting with the the emotional expression. SubhanAllah, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself was uh, tending to people who are struggling emotionally. So when he saw Rasulullah restless because he wanted the direction of Qibla to go uh, to Al Kaaba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said, Falanuwaliyanaka Qibla tan tardaha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately gave a Rasul uh, that, that beautiful request to go back and face the direction of Mecca. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we know, uh, he said, وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى In Surah Al-Duha, he told Rasulullah, alayhi salatu wasalam, I'm going to give you, O Muhammad, until you are happy, until you are satisfied, until you are pleased. And we know Rasulullah, he said, I will never be pleased as long as any of my ummah is in the hellfire. So we have, we have very beautiful ayat in the Quran, but one of them, uh, this ayat of Raja, the ayat of hope, one of them is this ayah in Surah Al-Duha. The ulama, they said, uh, Rasul Rasulullah he told us, you know, he's not going to be satisfied as long as we are not with him in Jannah. And uh, the other ayat, one of them is in uh, Surah Al-Anfal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ 
لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah will never punish your Ummah as long as you are with them, O Muhammad. And Allah will never punish this Ummah as long as they seek istighfar. And the last one, as we know, is in Surah Al-Zumar, when Allah said, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْمَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ O my servants who have transgressed against yourself by committing sins, never, never give hope, never despair from Allah's mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, other examples of how he mended broken hearts was when he shielded uh, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. He put a huge wave between Nuh and his son. So Sayyidina Nuh don't see his son drowning in front of him. Another example, <coughs> when <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asked uh, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam to put uh, Prophet Ismail face down. He said, فَلَمَّا أَسْلَمَ وَتَلَّهُ لِلْجَبِينَ he asked him before he sacrificed his son to put him face down because uh, he doesn't want a father to see his son die in front of him. And uh, as we know, subhanAllah, I'm going to share a few examples also, and we can engage uh, in some discussion during the Q&A. But uh, one example in Al-Quran is uh, Surah Maryam. And we know, subhanAllah, <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, throughout a whole surah, gave a Sayyidah Maryam. Allah gave a Sayyidah Maryam, uh, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, many, many ways how to cope with her own anxiety when she got pregnant with Al-Masih alayhi salam. Allah said, uh, La tahzani. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told her not to engage in uh, grief and sadness. He said, Huzzi ilayki bi nakhla, shake the palm tree, engaged in some physical exercise. He said, uh, yeah. eat healthy, drink water, and uh, practice sleep hygiene. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, فَإِمَّا أَحَدًا لِلرَّحْمَنِ صَوْمًا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيَّةً Allah told her not to engage in negative self-talk and uh, wasteless or wasteful uh, speech. And uh, other examples in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, Prophet Yaqub, when he lost the Prophet Yusuf alayhima as-salam, he was heartbroken. We know that وَبِيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ فَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ He basically went blind alayhi salatu was salam. Musa alayhi salam, his mom, she was heartbroken when she lost her son. And both of them, they showed a human emotions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never reprimanded them for that. He actually showed us throughout the Quran that uh, these uh, human emotions and genuine feelings are to be shown and to be expressed as long as they are done in a safe and a healthy and a halal way, of course. The Quran is full of uh, examples of uh, anger, fear, sadness, joy, and other human emotions. And subhanAllah, uh, chapter 106, which is uh, Surah Quraysh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, فَلْيَعْبُدُ رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَامَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ If you are fearful, if you are hungry, if you don't have your basic needs met, you are not going to be the best uh, when it comes to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in order to fulfill your duty as a Khalifa to Allah fil Ard, it's very important that you feel safe and your basic needs are taken care of. And this includes uh, emotional deprivation and lack of psychological safety. When we talk about safety, it's not only physical safety in Islam, it's emotional safety, spiritual safety, uh, and so on. So Rasul being the best example and being a walking Quran, he needs to go and check on everybody around him. And during the night, he's uh, the one who's awake, is the first one to wake up, the last one to go to sleep, والسلام, to make sure that nobody is left behind, nobody in the Ummah is forgotten. And he's going to continue to do that on, uh, at the Sirat, he's going to continue to do that in the Day of Judgment, try to intercede on our behalf. Uh, he kept all of his dua for his ummah والسلام, because he's such a beautiful man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And remember when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, oh son of Adam, I fell sick and you did not visit me. And he said, oh Allah, how can I visit you? You are the Lord of the worlds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, didn't you know that uh, my servant so and so, he was sick and you did not visit him? If you have visited him, you have found me there. So when we visit the people who are sick, 
when we take care of uh, of people emotional needs we find allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there فمن كان يرجو لقاء ربه فليعمل عملا صالحا if you want to meet allah on a daily basis you don't only meet him in jannah you meet him every single day when you take care of people needs including your small family and including yourself inshallah uh, stress management is also a big topic in islam the quran and sunnah talk about uh, a stress that can come from external causes, maybe human and non-human. Uh, usually the interpersonal violence, a human violence is uh, deeply uh, what affects our soul. If there is a disaster that's uh, like natural disaster, like hurricane or you know fire or earthquake, usually uh, people don't get very upset. Uh, yes, there is a you know loss of a human lives and there is lots of tragedies that happen with that. But what affects us very deeply on a level of our soul, when people actually hurt us, when other humans hurt other humans, especially when adults hurt children, and that really get into our core beliefs and we don't feel safe around others, we don't trust other humans and so on. And subhanAllah, um, there are other reasons that are internal reasons that we engage in stress. Maybe you are uh, worried about Tomorrow, maybe we are uh, grieving about yesterday. Maybe we are not engaging the current moment. And throughout his life, Rasulullah he showed us how to control anger, how to uh, display joy, how to express sorrow, how to manage his anxiety. Alayhi gave us many examples. You know, one of them is uh, when you feel angry, maybe go and uh, make wudu with cold water. If you are standing, sit down. And maybe you should go and pray to raka, inshallah recite some Quran or Adhkar and go and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, talk to somebody that you trust. And uh, this is what he did. He was uh, the best uh, safe role model, the safest space for everybody around him. And subhanAllah, you know, uh, one thing maybe to remember uh, brothers and sisters is uh, the world is very unsafe. And uh, unfortunately it continues to be unsafe place. And when people ask me, Omar, what's your dream? I say my dream is to lose my job uh, as a trauma expert, uh, quote unquote, you know, that means there is no more trauma in the world. And subhanAllah, I don't think that will happen because uh, I was traumatized, my children were traumatized, and uh, we see human violence uh, as something that's going to continue to happen. So we know that the world is unsafe. So please make your small world safe place for your small family, for your children, for your spouse, for your parents, for your siblings, for your relatives, for your small community, for your neighbors, everybody around them, Muslim and non-Muslim, be a source of safety, be a source of light, be a source of joy, be a source of hope. Maybe you can save somebody's life, inshallah. And uh, in Islam, uh, pain and suffering is not necessarily uh, a punishment from Allah. It's rather a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wants to cleanse and inshallah our sins he wants to elevate our status in paradise and islam teaches us that uh, a human life is sacred so the topic of suicide is uh, something that we can talk about but subhanallah suicide in islam is seen as an act of despair that doesn't mean that we're going to condemn uh, somebody who was desperate if they die by suicide we make dua for them subhanallah in surah an nisa when allah talked about homicide and suicide uh, his tone Subhanahu wa ta'ala was very different. When he talked about homicide, he said, Allah is very angry with people who commit homicide. But when he talked about suicide, he said, Don't kill yourselves, don't hurt yourselves. Allah is the most merciful. He wants us to seek his mercy and find other exits than suicide and self-harm. And trauma survivors in Islam are directed to all of the resources, internal and external resources within themselves and within their community, inshallah. And looking after emotional needs is a sunnah in Islam. It's the best act of charity. Even smiling is an act of charity. Speaking up is an act of courage. So Islam wants us, inshallah, to speak up against injustice and oppression and so on. And subhanAllah, in Islam, uh, healing is a holistic approach. So we take care of uh, 
the body, the mind, the heart, and the soul. The safety is comprehensive. A trauma-informed approach is a healing-centered, a human-centered, uh, culturally humble, and also taking from the Quran and Sunnah, focusing on people's self, um, you know, coping skills and inner strength and their resiliency and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will speak up when we don't speak up on behalf of people who are oppressed, like when he spoke up on behalf of the blind man, the orphans, the woman who was complaining to Prophet ﷺ, Islam always try to bring people out of the shadows in Islam and people with the quote-unquote mental illness are very precious. They are, you know, part of the community, people with special gifts, different abilities. Uh, all of them, we need to build on their strength, inshallah, and include them as part of the solution. We don't see anybody as part of the problem. Rasul, salam, 10,000 Sahaba, they prayed behind him, and he knew every single one of them. He knew their talents, their skills, their difficulties, even the names of their children. If the children have animals, he knew the names of the animals. He was such a beautiful man, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Islam wants us, inshallah, to be equipped with all the tools and skills necessary to meet our full potential as Khalifatullah fil ard So inshallah, very briefly, we're going to talk uh, the year of the elephant. We touch on that. We know that there was trauma maybe 55 days before Rasulullah was born. The city of Mecca was about to be destroyed. Al-Kaaba was about to be destroyed by Abraha al-Habashi. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took care of, uh, you know, Mecca and took care of the Kaaba because he wanted the Rasulullah uh, to be born in a beautiful and safe environment. Unfortunately, before he was born, uh, his father Abdullah died. And then everybody was restless, waiting for a source of hope and healing and joy to come. And the Rasulullah was born. He was born and uh, his mother couldn't uh, nurse him. So subhanAllah, we know the story of Halima Saadiyah, how he was away from his mom for a number of years when the angels came and they opened his chest, alayhi salatu wasalam, and then how he became orphan again at the age of six when his mom died, when he was uh, helping uh, Um Ayman to actually dig the grave of his own mother. So here is a six-year-old who has his mom and dad, both of them died, alayhi salatu wasalam. And then when his uh, grandfather died, when Rasulullah was uh, eight-year-old, uh, his uh, cousins became very jealous of him. His cousins and his young you know, uncles, they basically um, they made Rasulullah go and take care of their sheep. He became a shepherd and subhanAllah, they didn't uh, value who he was. And usually we take people for granted and we don't know the value of somebody until we lose them. Rasulullah, he engaged in the practice of meditation and mindfulness uh, to the best of examples when he went to the cave of Hira and he became secluded there. And in the dark cave, he found the source of light. The revelation came to him. And we know the encounter between him and Jibreel alayhi salam was very difficult example for him. He went back to Khadija and he said, Khadija, I'm very scared. And the Sayyida Khadija, she covered him not only physically, she covered him emotionally and spiritually. And she was the best a source of support for him. Uh, we know that uh, uh, when the Wahi, when the revelation stopped, and the, the mushrikeen, they start to make fun of Rasulullah They said, Wadda'aka rabbuka wa qalak. He said, Allah have abandoned you, O Muhammad. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately revealed Surah Al-Duha. He said, Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Allah will never abandon you. Allah will never hate you. Uh, the mushrikeen, they engaged in character assassination. They uh, went and said, he's sahir, he's majnoon, he's liar. And they accused him of many things, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he was uh, asked to go publicly, uh, him and his sahaba were tortured. He lost his uh, three boys, his three sons. Um, the people, they took him and his family out of Mecca. And he was uh, basically uh, put in the Sha'ab outside Mecca for about three years. And then that time uh, was very difficult for him because he lost both Khadija and Abu Talib both his uh, wife and his uncle. He called it the year of sorrow, Amil Huzun. 
Then uh, the people of Ta'if, when he went uh, to seek refuge, they stoned him, alayhi salatu wasalam. They beat him up. And uh, Rasulullah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he had the option to destroy them. The angel of the mountains, he said, Rasulullah, I can destroy them. And Rasulullah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, no, maybe their children will worship Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was a source of uh, beauty and forgiveness, even for people who actually caused him to physically bleed, sallallahu alayhi wasalam. And he was uh, forced to migrate from Mecca to Medina, and we know how much he loved Mecca. Uh, the day of Badr was very difficult for him when he lost a number of his ashab and when he lost uh, one of his daughters. The dark day of Uhud, uh, and especially when he lost his uncle Hamza, the incident of Bir Ma'una, when he lost about 70 of his uh, sahaba, and they were the memorizers of the Quran. And subhanAllah, the battle of Mu'ta when he grieved his, uh, you know, cousin Jafar and Abdullah ibn Rawaha and Zaid and, and when he lost his three daughters. So he lost three sons and three daughters. Six out of his seven children, uh, they died in his life, alayhi salatu wasalam. Two of his wives, they died in his life, alayhi salatu wasalam. Sayyidah Khadija and Sayyidah Zainab. Uh, even though he can be the richest man in the world, he chose a life of modesty. So he was very poor, alayhi salatu wasalam. Many times he goes to sleep very hungry. Sayyida Aisha was accused, and subhanAllah, that was a very difficult uh, moment for him. And even though Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he wanted to punish one of his relatives who engaged in Hadith al ifik and was part of accusing Sayyida Aisha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself in Surah An-Nur, he said, وَلَا يَأْتَلِي أُولُ الْفَضْلِ مِنْكُمْ وَالسَّاعَةِ أَنْ يُؤْتُوا أُولِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلْيَعْفُوا وَلْيَصْفَحُوا أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ and Sayyidina Abu Bakr, he said, Oh Allah, I love for you to forgive me. And he went and forgave his relative. And subhanAllah, the day of Hudaybiyah, when Rasulullah wanted to go and do Hajj, and he was prevented from doing that. The day when he entered Mecca, and he had uh, the right to kill everybody. And he still said, Ma anni bikum. What do you think I'm going to do to you? And subhanAllah, he forgave them. He said, Idhabu fa antum لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. I'm going to say exactly what uh, Prophet Yusuf said to his brothers. I'm going to forgive you today. Even though they tried to assassinate him, they threw garbage on his back, alayhi salatu wasalam. He was poisoned by the Jew uh, lady, as we know. And uh, when he said goodbye to his companions who died, who were martyred, his wives, his grandchildren, many people died. And uh, subhanAllah, maybe next week uh, when... Inshallah, there is a lecture about grief. Maybe we can use the example of Rasulullah Even though when he was grieving his son Ibrahim, and the sun eclipsed, and many Sahaba, they said, oh, the sun has eclipsed because of Ibrahim's death. And Rasulullah he switched from being a, a father to being a prophet. And he said, He said, the sun and the moon will never eclipse for a human. They are a signs of from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even though he was going through severe grief of losing his own son, he reminded people of their uh, deen, their aqidah, and so on. Rasulullah was severely sick after he was poisoned. We know he was a yu'ak kama yu'ak rajulan. People saw how painful sakarat al maut they were for him. When he was tasting death, it was very difficult. When he said goodbye to his ummah, was very difficult. But subhanAllah, I want you to imagine and the last thing he uh, did, alayhi salatu wasalam, he lifted the curtain and he looked at his sahaba. And the last thing he saw was uh, them engaging in salah. So he smiled and he was very happy that the last thing that ummah was engaging in was uh, salah. So inshallah, make sure that you maintain your salah, uh, your connection with Allah and with the beloved Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, who remained very graceful throughout all of his trials and tribulations. And uh, maybe because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself was, quote unquote, his therapist. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the strength. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, uh, don't kill yourself over uh, people who don't want to follow you. Allah said, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ He told us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, how Rasulullah was uh, uh, internally struggling with emotions. And Allah told him to publicly display these emotions. There's nothing shameful in expressing emotions.
So the, the last thing I want to do, inshallah, before we uh, open it up for discussion in the next uh, few minutes is to just action item. Uh, because I, I love Rasulullah and they wanted, inshallah, to follow his role model. I wanted also to turn my trauma story to become a source of healing for others. So I, I created something called Untangled, which is, inshallah, try to break the cycle of trauma uh, through five different avenues. One is education, so we can tackle the stigma. Another one is training, so we can uh, build capacity. The other one is building safe spaces like this one, inshallah, building a community of care of uh, beautiful brothers and sisters like yourselves, and then uh, building resources for the community, resources that are uh, culturally humble and respectful of uh, the culture and the religion. And the last one is uh, building clinical services if people need them. So alhamdulillah, out of uh, this, this was built in Libya and was replicated in Syria and Bangladesh with the Rohingya refugees. I was able to uh, go to refugee camps, alhamdulillah, and try to do parenting workshops, try to do uh, marriage seminars to improve the relationship between spouses, and try, alhamdulillah, to engage in play and art activities with the children. You can see the beautiful uh, refugee children, and we take them on camps and retreats. And build some resources and some clinical services when needed. These are some of the chapters of the books that uh, I was uh, able with the grace of Allah to write. One book is called On the Shoulders of the Prophet. Uh, when the young Sahaba felt safe around Rasulullah, they actually came and they climbed on his shoulders. If we don't have Muhammad والسلام, our children might look for safety somewhere else. They might engage in uh, deviant ideologies and extremist ideas. And alhamdulillah, I was a psychosocial consultant for uh, Lamia's poem, which is an animated film about the Syrian refugees and how we can use, uh, inshallah, the Quran and Sunnah, the example here, example of Rumi, how he was a source of healing for a uh, young refugee a child. And then we engaged in the dialogue project uh, between uh, Syrian communities and the Native American communities. And the Native American, they welcomed the Syrians into the United States. Officially, they said, this is your country as much as it is our country. And Alhamdulillah Untangled is an actual book that uh, I'll be happy to send it to you by PDF. If you like, you can just email me. And uh, this is a beautiful child in the uh, Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh in Cook's Bazaar. SubhanAllah, even though he has Down syndrome, he was the only boy allowed to go to every single tent about 900,000 brothers and sisters are living there in very, uh, you know, ugly conditions. And this boy was a source of uh, happiness. Every time he will enter the tent, people will start smiling and subhanAllah. And you don't have to go to a refugee camp to find healing. There is trauma all over our communities and our small communities. So inshallah, start uh, acting locally. And alhamdulillah, during the pandemic, I was blessed to build a, a YouTube channel with my daughters, it's called the Daughter-Father Bonding Project, uh, how Muslim fathers can bond with their children, especially teenage daughters. And uh, The Wounded Healer is the book that was just published, and I really, really want, want you to engage in self-care. For me, even though uh, my trauma story in, involved, uh, you know, forced migration, racism, and death of family members, and witnessing many things during the Civil War, uh, I leaned on my faith, I loved my family, I practiced gratitude and engaged in acts of service, and this is what kept me safe and sane and what uh, actually healed my PTSD. This is my uh, website and my email. Inshallah, I just wanted to finish with a word of gratitude also, starting with the gratitude and finishing with the gratitude. I'm doing all of this work, even though it's a very emotionally heavy work, because I wanna honor people who died in my family, my sister was only 14 when she died of brain cancer, and uh, she's the reason I chose medicine. My uh, nephew, he died in 2014, was killed by ISIS, unfortunately, in Libya. And he was the source of me engaging in uh, anti-Islamo, you know, Islamophobia and anti-Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and interfaith dialogue and other activities to tackle hate. And my mom, Allah Yerhamha, who died in 2016, and she was uh, the source of uh, joy and uh, the source of strength for me. She was my best friend. She told me, Omar, uh, if you cannot be the source of uh, 
you know, joy and delight. Don't be the source of pain and distress. And subhanAllah, I'm going to finish with one thing that uh, my mom always does, which is she goes and visits the families of those who died, those who are sick in the hospital. And I say, mom, you don't even know them. These are total strangers. And she says, Omar, I know that they are going through difficult time. Maybe if I show up, I can take away some of their pain and suffering. So inshallah, uh, today, take care of you, take care of your small family, and uh, make sure that you have the actual, the best curriculum, the Quran and Sunnah, the story of Rasulullah alayhi And with that, inshallah, I would love to hear your thoughts and open it up for discussion. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Omar. On the behalf of all of our participants, all of our members and all of our colleagues, uh, we see how much they are appreciating your beautiful uh, lecture and presentation of, of, of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, healing journey. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also keep you in our safeguard. Uh, your excellent work are very much needed in this day and age when a lot of Muslims all over the world are suffering from trauma, whether through migration, through being a refugee, or also through other domestic issues as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you tell fit when you're in under words. Round of applause, dear brothers and sisters and participants. Uh, you can uh, use your digital applause as well, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Omar. And I really resonate with a lot of the things that you're mentioning about your own healing trajectory. I think all of us who went into the mental health field, <laughs> we are dealing with our own wounds as well. And that's why our own saluk and spiritual wayfaring is so important in order for us to be of good service for our fellow brothers and sisters who are suffering as well, so that we don't think that their suffering is not part of us, that it's something that we also can relate to, and that it's also part of our uh, constitution as well. So don't we don't get this kind of like higher hierarchical way of looking at people who are suffering, because that's a microcosmos of ourselves as well, and our internal struggles. It's all universal in a sense. Jazakallah khairan dear Ustad. There is a lot of questions in the chat. I will address some of them to you, Dr. Omar. I also want to tell all brothers and sisters, feel free to write more questions in the chat and we will try to address them as much as we can. We have a couple of minutes left. Also, uh, Dr. Omar, you mentioned that uh, you would love to share your book. So with your permission, if you share it with us, we will email out the book of Dr. Omar, The Wounded Healer, to, or it was The Entangled. Uh, sorry, which book was it that you said you could share, Dr. Omar? I forgot uh, the last uh, title. You said that yeah, you, 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 untangled, untangled. yeah yeah so that one all of the all of you who registered to the lecture we will email out uh, both information about dr omar's amazing work and books and everything and also this book that dr omar is so generous enough to share with us so register yourself if you haven't uh, sister nadir or sister um, shirin or sister fatima could you share the registration link jazakallah khairan. all right dear ustad mashallah uh, I will not. I want to offer you some chai, Ustad, but I I can't send it to to Colorado. But uh, hopefully, I will give you some chai next, next time we meet. Um, Amir Amin is asking, uh, Doctor, uh, what is the nature of healing? Does healing uh, does healing fill some void in our psyche or in our brains? If it's the psyche, what is it that our psyche is being filled with, and what is the nature of our psyche? And if it's the brain that needs to be healed. Can we erase or put cover on the trauma memory of the patient in the amygdala to heal him? Could you please also elaborate the concept of healing from the perspective of the Prophet Ayyub ailment and his healing? MashaAllah. <laughs> Beautiful you know, question that needs a textbook, <laughs> needs another, its own lecture, subhanAllah. I believe that healing is a comprehensive and Thank you for reminding me of what the story of Prophet Ayyub. I need to include that, inshallah, because he was a very beautiful example of sabr and how he was graceful going through his own uh, trials and tribulations. But I believe that healing is a uh, comprehensive. So subhanAllah, yani, it's not only the mind that's affected by traumatic memories. It's uh, re really, you know, the body keeps the score. So and there is trauma in the body. So many trauma survivors, they have physical symptoms. They have somatic pains have, you know, muscle aches, they have migraines, they have non-epileptic seizures and so on, but also it affects our heart, our relationship with others, our core beliefs and uh, the world that, uh, is it a safe place for me to engage with others after I've been traumatized? And I believe it uh, mainly affects our soul. That's why, uh, you know, the wounded healer, I talk about burnout as a moral distress. It's uh, the caregiver, PTSD is not a mental disorder, it's a soul ache. So our soul aches and 
uh, really healing comprehensively needs to take uh, all of these four into account. Many times, Brother Amir, we, we uh, take a vacation and uh, we try to rest. And when we come back to work, we need another vacation. This is usually because we only focus on our bi biological needs. We are only trying to heal our body. But remember, subhanAllah, our mind is trying to you know, process traumatic memories. Our heart is trying to answer difficult questions. Our soul is uh, having existential questions. All of these things we need to tend to. So yes, I mean, I agree with you. There are tra traumatic memories and repressed memories and the role of the amygdala and the limbic system and so on. But I think this is much more bigger than just uh, the brain. This is the, the body, the mind, the heart, and the soul together, inshallah. Jazakallah khair and dear Ustad for a thorough uh, answer. We go to next question, uh, Dr. Omar. Uh, Indra Fatiana, she's asking, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have his own source to heal his wound and how did it work? How his own source to heal his wound and how did it work? As mentioned in many perspectives, human has their mechanism to heal their trauma, psychological illness. His source of healing, where did, where did it come from, is her question. Yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, I, I'm a big believer that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself was uh, taking care of Rasulullah uh, This, uh, though, we need to be very careful because people will say, oh, this is Rasulullah. He was supported by Allah himself, so I cannot do it. And uh, many people, they you know fall into despair because they think that uh, this shifa, this healing was only exclusive for Rasulullah. But subhanAllah, the Quran and the Sunnah, they are available for all of us. And this is the beauty of our religion, uh, Brother Jamal, which is if you want to talk to Allah, go and pray. If you want Allah to talk to you, go and open the Mus'haf. So 24-7, Allah himself, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the source of healing is available for us. And this is what Rasulullah was doing. He was always seeking out that healing. He was always engaging in salah and dhikr. Sayyida Aisha, she said, every time I wake up, he's awake. He's making qiyam al-layl. He is taking care of uh, people affairs. And subhanAllah, I mean, yes, I, I'm a big believer of uh, in taking care of the caregiver. At the same time, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, one thing I found to be a source of healing for me, even when I completely burnt out, is to engage in acts of service. So even though I'm tired taking care of people, I go and take care of a refugee family or uh, go and do an act of khair. And subhanAllah, it gives me more refreshment in my soul. So maybe my body is tired, but I get my rest when I take care of my soul. Maybe my soul is tired, I take care of my heart. And subhanAllah, and, he, and that's why the approach is comprehensive. And that's why Rasul was always going to the pure source of healing which is uh, the Quran, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And that source is always available for us. Amen. It's not only exclusive for the prophets. And uh, I, I really want to touch base on a beautiful, you know, thing that you say, Brother Jamal, which is uh, Rasul Rasulullah was available emotionally for everybody. He was not mm -hmm. picking and choosing. And, you know, when uh, one lady died, she was cleaning the masjid. Rasul Rasulullah, he was looking for her. He said, where is she? And the Sahaba said, oh, Rasulullah, she died last night and we went ahead and we buried her. And he was very angry. He said, how can you bury her when you didn't tell me? He, he, even though she was a custodian of the masjid, she was somebody who was cleaning the masjid. She was very beloved to him, alayhi People with mental illness, people with epilepsy, people with all kinds of issues, they come to him because he was a source of safety. So he never engaged in any kind of racism or discrimination. Everybody was treated equally by him. Everybody was accessible to Rasulullah and he was available for them. Jazakallah khaira, mashallah. Such a, remember one of my teachers spoke, Dr. Omar, about the sunnah therapy. Sunnah therapy, it's free. You don't need to pay thousands of dollars to go to a PT and all honestly, you have it for free. You know, it's a sunnah to walk in the nature and just to explore the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. It's a sunnah to, as you say, to pray our obligatory prayers and also those uh, that are also um, included in them. Uh, and also uh, just to do the sunnah disciplines, you know, go archery, go horseback riding. These are all, you know, tools we have. And, you know, our life is centered about around nature. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, all the signs that we can find of his creation in nature as well. 
So you're so correct, you know, that we have such a rich toolbox, we can call it, that we can just utilize. And it's free and it's for everyone, subhanAllah. Thank you so much. Uh, there is a lot of lot of questions and we will address some some more, uh, Dr. Omar. So we have from um, Sister Nadira, how to face or process a trauma rooted back from our parents' parenting style, inner childhood trauma, that it's been too long that it becomes part of our personality. How to dissect it so we get our own closure? Very good question. Yeah, subhanAllah. This is a really very excellent question that I'm very passionate about because if we don't process our trauma, we might transmit our trauma to our children. So the first thing is, uh, you know, purify your knee and say, oh Allah, even though I have been through a difficult time, I'm doing this for your sake and in order not to continue this cycle. I don't want my children and grandchildren to have a transgenerational trauma. So the trauma is going to stop with me. And this is when we, inshallah, engage in our own healing using the example of Rasulullah But if needed, we can also use the resources in the community. So absolutely, remember, uh, sometimes we need more than engaging in Quran and Dua. All of these are beautiful tools. Our toolkit might contain other tools, though. And there is nothing wrong with that. It's not a source of a stigma or reason to judge people if they are going through a difficult time. So healing uh, a past trauma, especially childhood trauma. So make the niyyah that you don't want this to pass to your children. And then if there is a room for healing, and subhanAllah, this is uh, something that we need to be very delicate about. We don't force people to forgive uh, their abuser. I want people to forgive themselves. Remember the abuse that happened to you as a child is not your fault. And subhanAllah, maybe your abuser, they also had a history of abuse May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, give them their own healing. So if they are not engaged in that process, make dua for them. At least uh, say, oh Allah, I transfer my file from the court of dunya to the court of akhirah. And if there is a room for healing, if uh, people you know, are engaging in forgiveness and mending, and if people are actually asking for forgiveness and trying to make amends, and if people are apologizing, it would be nice if you accept that apology. You don't necessarily have to forget, but it will be beautiful to forgive because uh, it will take that burden off your shoulders and mainly, mainly self-forgiveness, please. It's interesting, Dr. Omar. Thank you so much for your uh, thorough uh, answer. The difference between forgive and forget, perhaps. Like you can forgive, but then you can perhaps not forget, but then you can learn from that experience. And it's easier said than done. We don't want to spiritually bypass anyone as mental health professionals. We know it's a struggle. And it's not easy and we shouldn't bypass anything psychologically or spiritually. I was just reflecting upon your answer, Dr. Omar, with regards to the intergenerational trauma, because it's an, in, in, in a sense, uh, what you're addressing is that if we put in the court of Akhira, then we're breaking the international intergenerational trauma in dunya. Um, would you say that that takes time to do that transition from, and also acknowledgement, because sometimes if you get acknowledgement of your suffering from the one who oppressed you, that's part of your healing trajectory. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ, he got acknowledgement from some of his oppressors who became Muslims and they did tawbah, right? That was acknowledgement, right? Both towards Allah and also towards the Prophet ﷺ. So what happens if we don't get that acknowledgement? Because in many situations, we don't get that acknowledgement. Um, yeah. Any any thoughts on how we can still resolve that? Yeah, jazakallah khair. Yeah, subhanAllah, in Untangled, I, I share a concept called love. Love, the L stands for listening, the O for options, the V for validation, and the E for empowerment. So we, whenever we work with somebody through trauma, we need to listen to their story. We need to give them options. It's not only one way. And uh, we need to validate their experience and then empower them by making them part of the solution and not dictate things uh, on them actually we uh, do things with them not for them and subhanallah yani, uh, as you said many many times we don't receive that validation and uh, it's very important that we really seek internal validation even though it's very difficult very emotionally exhausting uh, if uh, you are not receiving from an outside uh, outside source it's really difficult to continue to have emotional 
gas in your tank to continue to give to others, especially if you are a wounded healer, if you are a caregiver. But subhanAllah, if you always go back to the source, which is uh, never depleted, which is the Quran, the Sunnah, the story of Rasulullah And this is why one of the questions I just uh, saw coming, uh, you know, that, that they ask if uh, Islamic psychology is enough. Do we need really Western psychology? And subhanAllah, Islamic psychology is not a, a new field. Actually, I think most of the quote-unquote Western psychology is based on our beautiful, you know, example of our deen. And, uh, you know, if there are good things that uh, are compatible with our Quran and Sunnah and Western psychology, there is no harm in using them. But we don't rely exclusively on them. At the same time, we use all kinds of resources. Remember, people with the schizophrenia or bipolar, for example, they might need medication management. So it's very important that we seek all kinds of cure because uh, Rasulullah he said every disease has a cure. So he asked us to go and seek the cure wherever it is. Well, hikmah dhalat al mu'min. You know, uh, the, the wisdom belongs to the believer. Wherever you find it, you, you are at the owner of that wisdom, inshallah. Awesome. And it's actually something that we advocate as well, Dr. Omar, that uh, in ISIP, that it's about rooting yourself in your paradigm. So essentially rooting yourself in the Quran and the Sunnah. But then be curious, because there is always, as you say, and this is part of our Sunnah, uh, hikmah all over the place, including Western psychology. We're not against Western psychology. We're just not in reliance only on it. We want to learn and filter out the things that are not applicable and utilize those. And that's the historical way where Islamic psychology was developed by our traditional scholars. They were trained and rooted in their paradigm and the Islamic paradigm, then they studied Greek thought or Persian thought or Chinese thought or whatever thought, you know? So this is something that we also emphasize, emphasize dear brothers and sisters. We reiterate our Ustad Dr. Omar's um, emphasize, emphasizing on rooting yourself in your tradition, but be curious. And there is also, I mean, in trauma, there is a lot of modalities in Western psychology that we can utilize dealing with people that are facing trauma. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Omar. We have uh, from Sister Mahmoud a very interesting question here. I think, where is, oh, no, it's another, okay, Sister, oh, Sister Mahmoud. Yes, this is a question from her. How can a woman who is having a worst, uh, a worst of traumatic experience heal? She has experienced sexual abuse since childhood, and the abuser is her own family member uh, who is always around in life, her own father. After she got independent and could oppose, it becomes very difficult for her when she listens to Islamic lectures talking about patterns and rights upon her. Again, that's that established the wound as raw. I am a therapist who recently got this case. Please throw some lights upon this. Jazakallah khaira. Yeah, subhanAllah. Uh, let me first, inshallah, uh, talk about, uh, you know, Islamic psychology and Western psychology. And subhanAllah, we don't have to take, uh, you know, Western models and quote, quote, Islamize them. We have the pure source of the Quran and Sunnah. And uh, inshallah, we can actually build our own authentic, you know, curricula and models from scratch but uh, at the same time if there is something beneficial in western psychology absolutely we can use it inshallah and for sister mahmoud's question subhanallah this is a very you know difficult thing when and there is an incest incest most likely is the most difficult wound to heal unfortunately because it's a sexual trauma that a child uh, was touched and especially touched by a family member in this case a father which uh, you know, the reason that we should feel safe. So what happens to children when they don't feel safe, when their trauma is here every day, when the monster never leaves, the monster comes out of the closet every night. SubhanAllah, it's a very difficult experience. So if, if there are resources for immediate safety, of course, if we are aware of uh, immediate abuse that's happening, we make sure that uh, children are protected. If this is an adult, and many, many adults are, you know, survivors of childhood trauma. And unfortunately, if you go through a sexual trauma, many times you don't enjoy your childhood. Many times you don't, you actually miss out on most of your childhood. You grow up uh, quickly and uh, you really, unfortunately, learn things, uh, habits that uh, you should not have learned, unfortunately, because you want to protect yourself. So it's very important that you make sure that you are protected. Make sure that what you are engaging in right now, in the here and now, are safe and healthy coping skills. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a room for healing with the father, that would be wonderful. 
if that's not the case, that uh, they, they have the option. They can say, oh, Allah, I forgive them for your sake, but uh, make sure that you don't see that as another reason that Islam is uh, condoning abuse or condoning that behavior because Islam never condones abuse. Actually, Rasulullah, when he was told about uh, Sahaba who are beating their wives, he said, Ma they are not the best among you. He was very, very clear uh, standing against domestic violence and all kinds of uh, abuse towards especially women. So if Rasulullah was approached with this topic, I would argue that Rasulullah will immediately step in, make sure that the sister is protected, and then go and see what's wrong with the brother. How can you hurt your own a beautiful daughter? Uh, if there is room for healing and reconciliation after forgiveness, and subhanAllah, you know, healing uh, uh, these relational wounds usually needs three things. One is STR. The S is uh, feeling safe. So safety is very important. If you don't feel safe, usually you're not going to speak up. The T is uh, a telling, you know, storytelling or telling your truth. So after you feel safe, you can share your trauma story without being invalidated or a gas lit or anything like that. And then the R stands for reconciliation. If there is room for reconciliation and healing, so alhamdulillah. But how can you support the sister who is coming to your office? As long as she is coming to your office, that you are doing a great job, that you are a source of safety. Maybe you are the only source of safety and sanity for the sister during that week. So continue to um, keep your door open. Don't dig for the graphic details of what happened. Just remind her that she survive the worst of her trauma, remind her of her resilience, her coping skills, uh, how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah love her and how much uh, inshallah she can break the cycle for her children. And uh, if uh, there is no room for forgiveness, uh, she can transfer her case to the court of Allah. And that's a court that's very scary. There is no injustice there, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Thank you so much for an elaborate answer. Thank you also, Sister Mahmouda, for sharing your case. Very important. So we have another question, Dr. Omar. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. We have four minutes left, so we'll do two more questions. Uh, this is from Sister Amreen. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for an amazing session. I wanted to ask if there is a book for spouses who are healing from their own past trauma. Like how can they heal their attachment wounds from the past so that they don't show it in the present relationship with their spouse? Yeah, mashallah. And uh, I'm aware, alhamdulillah, and ISIP and al balkhi there's wealth of uh, resources. But if you have a specific question about a specific topic, please email me. I would be happy, inshallah, to have um, this discussion going on. I'm also on LinkedIn. So please, if I didn't answer your questions today, we still have a relationship and I would love to, con to continue to hear from you, inshallah. Inshallah. We will share all the contact information of Dr. Omar also. Some people were asking for your YouTube channel with your daughters. Sister Nadira shared it, actually. So we will also email out. Dear brothers and sisters, register yourself so that you get this email. If you haven't registered for the lecture today, you will get all the resources, the books, uh, more information about Dr. Omar's excellent works, the YouTube channel too. Is, I actually watch your YouTube channel. It's amazing. So we will share also the details uh, and LinkedIn and everything, or at least the email. I don't know if everybody has LinkedIn because international community. So inshallah. And also, Dr. Omar, we would love to host you again, inshallah, soon, because we see there is a big interest so that we can work with you, inshallah, and do things with you. It will be such an honor. So uh, as Dr. Omar said, uh, he will give you nasiha uh, with regards to resources, um, personally. We really appreciate that. Uh, and also, we have a digital library, as Dr. Omar mentioned, uh, in the ISIP and al -Balkhi. If you go to our website, you can get access to it. There is a lot of resources there, dear sisters and brothers, that you can benefit from, inshallah. Uh, uh, all right, this will be the last question. Let me see. I'm going to see if there is any repetitive questions or. Uh, all right. Brother Alex is asking this question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for the lecture. As a new Muslim, I find a source of courage from the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him. The landscape would have been different at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. How does one as a new Muslim navigate the mental health challenges that we face on a daily basis? SubhanAllah, this is important. Most covert journeys are highly emotional and the topic is so multifaceted, it's difficult to derive the, the, derive the correct path and times. Imam Ghazali's journey is a fascinating one. Also, I wonder if you had any thoughts on that. 
Yeah, mashallah. And uh, remember, subhanAllah, this is a great privilege that, uh, that, that all the Sahaba, they were new Muslims. So subhanAllah, you know, um, that usually section of uh, the Muslim society is many times ignored or neglected. We make takbir when somebody entered Islam, then we forget about them and that they have their own struggles. And many times, you know, they face alienation from their family, from their community. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you strength through that. Continue to use the example of Rasulullah He is always accessible to you, but also remember healing doesn't happen only in isolation. It happens when we build a community. That's why subhanAllah, mashallah, about 155 people in the room. Uh, mashallah, all of you are resources for one another. All of us are a community of care. We lean on one another. So please never feel that you are alone. Never feel that you are desperate. You are part of an ummah, inshallah, and, uh, and the day that you decided to join Islam, um, you became part of the family, and we really need to practice what we preach and become family for one another. And subhanAllah, any, if you benefit anything from this lecture, it's because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because uh, you love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And subhanAllah, even though the time was very short, we only touched on many of the traumas that happened to him, uh, be Abi Huwa wa Ummi. But subhanAllah, each one of these traumas needs its own section. It will become its own chapter in the book. And that's why I'm really, really, if you can do me a favor and continue to send me uh, some of the examples that uh, we have not touched on today. MashaAllah, the story of Prophet Ayyub was one of them. And then if there is anything that you like to see happen when the book is uh, released, inshallah, this book, I hope, will be a source of healing for everybody. Muslim and non-Muslim because Rasulullah was a rahmatan lil alameen. He was mercy for all. Dr. Roma, jazakallah khairan for your beautiful words. Um, so there is a lot of questions. So with your permission, I will send the questions to you. And when you have time, you can answer them just by text and we will email it out. Would that be okay with you, Dr. Omar? There's like five, six questions. There's a question about the inner child, for instance. It's a very good question. I, I noticed that, sister, by the way. You wrote to me, sister... Uh, Najia, uh, because of the time difference, and also Dr. Omar is very early for him. I don't want to take too much of his time. We will address them afterwards. These are all excellent questions, sister. Jazakallah khairan. So, dear brothers and sisters, uh, let's give round of applause to our beloved uh, teacher, Ustad, Dr. Omar Rida. Thank you so much for uh, for blessing us honestly uh, with your presence and allowing us to learn from your vast amount of knowledge and experience. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keep you in his safeguards so that we can benefit from your work many years to come. And as you know, Dr. Omar, we've been speaking with each other for many years now. We are your brothers and sisters. We are your colleagues and we're always at your service. And we're so honored to have you as part of our ISIP and Belkhi board. And we will benefit so much by working with you. Dear brothers and sisters, we will send all the resources that Dr. Omar referred to, including his contact details, PowerPoint presentation, his father-daughter YouTube channel, his book, and also, please buy his books as well. We need to support our teachers, actually. And then when they're doing this amazing work, if you have the economical resources, then buy it. Well, we will share also the one that he gave us for free as well, of course. This is our duty and pleasure. Uh, we know that all of our brothers and sisters don't have the economical means to, to buy books. So I per personally live in Sweden. I do have some of these privileges. Definitely, we will support you on that. Uh, I will support you on that. I don't think there's any other uh, reflections right now besides that we will uh, allow Dr. Omar to answer these questions and send it to you through the through email. If you just register yourself again, the YouTube uh, lecture, this lecture with Dr. Omar will be uploaded on ISIP's YouTube channel within a couple of days. Feel free to subscribe and benefit from over 100 lectures in different languages. Some of them are colleagues of Dr. Omar from our Arabic task force as well. Uh, and yes, thank you so much for being so engaged, dear brothers and sisters. This is such an important topic, honestly. And we will continue in this trajectory. Uh, we will continue speaking about trauma and healing in different modalities and different approaches. And as Dr. Omar so eloquently uh, have pointed us that the healing comes from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu to understand it, to embody it, to learn from it. And the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inshallah. So we will definitely be in touch with Dr. Omar. We will do more lectures with him. We will also share all of his organizations and beautiful initiatives, inshallah. 
And uh, actually, I want to announce that we're establishing a couple of new task forces in ISAP, dear excellent participants, brothers and sisters. And we want to ask Dr. Omar to be part of these task forces, inshallah. I know you're very busy, but at least as our advisor, it will be an honor and to learn from you. One is about uh, re refugee mental health. And we will announce this in our WhatsApp group and through email with all of you who registered. One is about trauma generally. And one is uh, revert slash convert uh, mental health, because we have a lot of converts uh, in ISAP and also in our communities that they convert to Islam. And unfortunately, we as Muslims, we don't provide them the space that Dr. Oma referred to, to give them this family uh, strength. And some of them are isolated from their uh, blood family because they don't accept their conversion. And then they feel very uh, isolated and there is a lot of mental health issues there. So we want to support all of our beloved converts. Uh, so feel free to join that one as well. And as Dr. Omar alluded to, the Sahaba were all, all converts, by the way. So sometimes when we speak about the Sahaba, it's like we think they were always Muslims, but they were not. They were converts. So subhanAllah, this is an amazing thing to always uh, get back to, inshallah. Any other things, Dr. Omar, you want to add before we end? No, mashallah, I just want to show gratitude and please lean on one another for support and make sure today you take care of your family. This weekend, spend it with your loved ones and uh, spend it maybe sharing some stories about the beloved so we can have a beautiful weekend, inshallah. Jazakum Allah khair. Jazakallah khairan. Uh, all of us, we really find you so humble and so generous with your time and we love to connect with you. So brothers and sisters, please have uh, Dr. Omar and his family in your du'as and he is your teacher as his, uh, my teacher, and we will connect with him through social media, through LinkedIn, email, whatever, and his YouTube channel and his books. Read his books and learn from his vast amount of knowledge. All right, everybody, we will end the lecture now. We will end the recording. Uh, Dr. Omar, thank you.